All right, my dudes, I hope we're doing well. I know there are a lot of videos to watch this week and I apologize for that, but we didn't have time to really go through the uh, type information that we had on Canvas. I just wanna have a quick video where I run through that with you guys. And then um, I've got some links for videos that I can send you to that give you sort of better practical application of the type tools I think than I could record for you. So let's just read through the notes and then uh, we'll take it from there. Okay, so as we saw on Canvas, this is all going to change. I'm going to be uploading a lot of tutorials that follow along with our Illustrator tutorial. But let's take a look at the design principles with regards to typography. So I've got that file open here and we're about halfway actually in the bottom section of those files there on slide 28 here. And we're going to take a look at typography. So basically, I'm just going to read through this with you guys as though we were in class and then you'll be able to just have a better understanding of typography and uh, the different things that go into the art of typography. So basically, typography is the art of arranging type. We're surrounded by words and text in almost every waking moment of our lives, whether that be uh, us seeing advertisements on billboards, in magazines, what we see content online when we're scrolling social media. And we need to be able to assume that at some point, every typeface, every font that we're seeing in the text that we're reading, wherever we happen to be, that there was a little bit of thought put into that. Uh, well, we would hope so at least. So a typeface or font using your designs is gonna give the viewer an impression before they even get a chance to actually read what the text says. So if I had a body of text in Comic Sans, you're gonna notice the forms of the characters before you actually read the content. So immediately that can give you an idea of um, the tone or the message involved. Um, just in terms of technical, um, terms, I guess is the word I'm looking for. A typeface is a family of fonts, while the font is one weight or style within that type family. So for example, we've got a couple of um, fonts over here underneath one typeface. So this is the house typeface, and these are each separate fonts within that family. So the font is what you use, but the typeface is what you see. All right. Uh, in terms of our variations of text, um, there are different types and they fulfill different roles. So our initial sort of uh, introduction is just regular text type. Uh, you guys will be familiar with this if you've ever read a magazine or a book before. Um, these are designed to be used in large quantities at small sizes. Most newspapers and magazines uh, will use this type as a good example of text type. And most importantly, text type needs to be easily reg uh, legible. So our text type are the large bodies of text. They need to be easy on the eye so that the viewer doesn't or the reader doesn't get tired while digesting that information. And um, text type has been specifically designed. Most of the typefaces we use for text type has been designed to be quite easy on the viewer's eyes. We then have display type, which is to be used in small quantities for emphasis and effect. The goal of your display type is to be noticed. So essentially the heading that we see in our top example here, we have an example of display type designed to catch our attention. And then we actually have text type that uh, gives us the information we would then read. You can imagine if we were trying to read paragraph upon paragraph of uh, type using this typeface would become quite tiring on the eyes. So there's a big difference there. And when it comes to using the type for your poster, you definitely wanna be focusing on a display type, something that is quite bold, quite catchy, but not something that you would use to write an essay in. Um, typically, as motion designers, we often work with voiceovers. So whenever we're dealing with large bodies of information, we typically have a voiceover to help the viewer actually digest what we're seeing. So we very seldom ever need large bodies of text on screen. We typically animate the visuals to go according to that voiceover. So we too tend to uh, stick to display type to really just emphasis or highlight the uh, most important areas of information being spoken by the, the narrator or the voiceover artist. Just coming down into some technical things um, are different types of letter forms. You guys might be familiar with the term serif and sans serif. They're two very popular forms of typeface. Our serif is typically more traditional. The characters are identified by the short strokes on the end of the character's strokes or stems. So these little portions on the V, for example, would be the serifs. The sans serif, sans just means without. These are distinguished by their lack of these sort of um, little tails that we see on the arms of the letter itself and they're considered a bit more modern, both historically as well as aesthetically, and these typefaces gained popularity around the 19th century or so. We then have the concept of slab serif, and this is just a subcategory of the serif typeface. 
major difference is that both the horizontal and vertical strokes are the same thickness throughout. So in our example here, this is just a regular serif font. If this was a slab serif, then our stems or the arms of this V would be the same thickness throughout. We then have script. These are based on handwritten letters. So these typefaces are generally attached. Anything that looks as though it is a cursive handwritten note, for example, would be considered a script type. We then have monospace, where our letters are all equidistant horizontally. Monospace typeface was first created for use with the typewriter. Um, and you guys can obviously visually tell that there is a sort of a visual style when recreating that typewriter kind of effect. Um, so it was designed so that the spacing was always equal so that as we hit those keys, they then collide with one another or overlap or overwrite the letters. Uh, coming down to typographic letter forms, we also then have black letter or fracture. Uh, these typefaces look broken because each symbol is made up of individual strokes and they have a very heavy gothic appearance. So if you guys are familiar with the gothic font, uh, you might find that in um, Microsoft Word. I know that I quite enjoyed using that when I was edgy back in the day. So anything that's quite heavy, quite Germanic, we just give that the label of a black letter or fracture typeface. And then lastly, we need to consider the hierarchy of our typefaces. So if all of our type was the same size, it would be very difficult to determine the most important information on screen. Size, spacing, color, and visual weight can all be used to achieve visual hierarchy. So once again, just coming back up to our newspaper example, it's very easy for us to tell that we should read the main heading first, the subheading second, and then move on to the actual um, text type here because of their visual weight. One is much larger, much bolder, catches our eye, and then leads us on to the next piece of visual information. So it's a good idea to play around with visual hierarchy, making sure that your viewer always knows the most important, the first step to read, moving on to the second step, moving on to the third step, etc. When we talk about appearance, we can refer to kerning, tracking, size, leading, and justification. So kerning just refers to the adjustment of the spaces between specific letters. The purpose of kerning is to create a constant visual rhythm of space between the characters, and this aids in legibility, as well as make sure that the characters are optically correct. In the end, it's all about creating what looks right rather than a body of text that's mathematically correct. So we very seldom need to worry about kerning when it comes to creating text copy, large sort of volumes of text that needs to be read. But when it comes to creating our sort of display type, the large bold headings or these large sort of action type here printed on the wall, we do want to make sure that the word looks correct. And that outweighs the math that would normally be involved when actually typing out the content. Just as an example, you can see in our word kerning that uh, even though the word looks visually right, there's no visual difference between the spaces between each letter. You can actually see with the guides that have been given, for example, that the space between the R and the N is a lot different from the space between the K and the E. And that's because of the negative space around the characters used. So we would really get into the nitty gritty there when creating our display type to make sure that it looks visually correct. Uh, we then have the term tracking. This relates to the spacing of all characters when they're applied evenly. So when we normally type things out, we just rely on the tracking involved. But if something is quite large and viewers are going to be looking at it, we do want to then dive in and adjust the kerning so that we can make sure that they don't find any visual errors in the word that they see. Taking a look at size, some typefaces are obviously quite large, others can be quite thin and narrow. So this means that different typefaces can have a drastic effect on the amount of space a word or a phrase is going to have on the page. Uh, taking a look at our example here on the right, you can imagine that if crazy ones had been written in any of these other typefaces, it would take up more or less space, depending on how thick or thin the inherent typeface is. So that's something we take into account as well. A technical term that we use is called X height. This refers to the height of a character. So we kind of just use X as the base standard when measuring most characters. So the X height refers to the height of a character and the width of a character is known as the set width, which includes both the body of the letter and the space that lies between it and the next letter. Leading describes the vertical spaces that we see between uh, bodies of type. The name originates from strips of lead that were used to separate the lines of type in days of metal typesetting. And a comfortable legibility is often achieved when the leading value is anywhere between 1.25 and 1.5 um, times the font size. Um, 
we're not going to spend too much time worrying about size and leading, uh, especially not at this level, but it is a good idea to have an understanding of these terms at this stage. Justified, this just means that the contents are arranged so that there is no white space at the end of a line. So each line begins flush with the left and ends flush with the right. So you guys will be familiar with left aligned, center aligned and right aligned type if you've ever worked in any kind of um, text sort of based tool such as Microsoft Word or if you've gone into Adobe Illustrator. Justification simply means that there's no white space on either side. So if we imagine a big box surrounding um, this example of text, everything would be justified both to the left and the right. They all start at the same point on the left and end at the same point on the right. Measure simply describes the width of a text block. So we would say that the measure of this entire text block here is X number of millimeters, for example. And then the gutter refers to the spaces between our columns of text. So coming back up to our newspaper example, we would call both the horizontal and vertical spaces between our blocks of uh, copy here as our gutters. All right. And then lastly, just in terms of application. So obviously this is the, the most important part is how we go about using the typefaces that we use. So first thing, make sure that we match the mood. Every typeface is going to have its own mood and personality and not everyone's going to interpret your choice of font in the same way. So make sure, first of all, who your target audience is and then gauge the relevance of your potential reception of your choice. So again, if I was typing out a memo that was going to a Fortune 500 company, I'm not going to use Comic Sans. But if I was typing out a birthday invitation for a two-year-old, Comic Sans might be acceptable. Well, Comic Sans is never acceptable, but in this example, it stands. Lastly, we just need to know how to limit the number of typefaces that we use. So too many different typefaces in a design can look pretty messy, and it gives the idea that we didn't know which one to pick, so we just chose all of them. Basically, there are some sort of standard rules that we can follow. Generally, a basic serif font will work really well with a sans serif font. So those slight differences of tails on one type of face and then the lack of tails on the other complement each other quite well. But typically, a very safe bet is to simply just use multiple fonts from the same family. So if I come back on up to my house example here, um, if I needed to do a particular design and I wasn't too sure on how to sort of complement my type, I could just use varying thicknesses of that same family because they all have the same general style. They complement each other with that similarity, but then the difference in thicknesses in those uh, fonts uh, would then set them apart and allow me to create visual hierarchy. Obviously, I'd read the extra bold portion first, moving down to the ultra light. Okay, so that is that for our type sort of read through. Taking a look at our Canvas page, we have some links to Google Fonts and Adobe Fonts. And I've also provided a tutorial on how to install fonts. This covers both installing fonts on Windows as well as Mac. Now, I'm not too familiar with Adobe Fonts, so I don't want to talk out my ass there, but I will quickly discuss Google Fonts, which I have to admit has been my best friend since the day I found it. So Google Fonts is absolutely fantastic. Everything that you find on Google Fonts is free. There's not going to be any licensing issues. You can use them both for your personal projects as well as for clients in the future. And there is a massive variety of different fonts and typefaces that we have available to us here. To give you a quick rundown, you can see that you can first start by searching. If you have an exact typeface that you're looking for, you could always search for it like that. Otherwise, we have some options under categories. You can see that I can check on various options here. So right now, all of them are turned on. It's going to show me all of my options. But if I was only looking for sans serif typefaces, I could turn off all of that and I would only then be presented with the sans serif fonts here. I'm just going to reset to turn those all back on. You can also change the languages. I'm not entirely sure if it automatically translates whatever it is that you type into your sentence phrase, but it can give you an idea of what these typefaces would look like if they were in different languages. Um, and then we have various front font properties so you can set for a number of styles, thicknesses, slanting and width, etc. I think that's going a little bit too in depth, so we'll ignore that for now. Something that I also really like about Google Fonts is that you can type your own phrase sentence here. So if I were to just type in example, you'll see that all of my types uh, that are being displayed to me here then actually match what I've written. So for example, if you were working on your poster and you wanted to find a typeface that worked really well for your personal slogan, 
I'm just gonna type in personal slogan because I am completely unoriginal. But I could then go and see what matches the sort of tone of whatever slogan it is that I've chosen. All right, now just to walk you through how to go about downloading and installing these from um, this uh, Google Fonts page. I like Roboto, so I'm just gonna click on that and you can see that it gives me a lot of information here. And there are a lot of different um, actual fonts in here. So we've got thin, thin italic, all the way up to black, which is bolder than bold. Um, so we can see that we've got a large variation here. To download this, I simply need to click on Download Family. That's going to then give me a zip file. If I quickly open that up, I can see here in my downloads, I've got Roboto and I've got all of these .ttf files. These are the font files that I would need to install. So I'm simply going to select all of these and double click on them. One major benefit to working on a Mac is that it allows you to install multiple fonts at once. On Windows, you'd have to go and double click on each of these on their own. But I simply need to say install and that gets added to my font library. So I've now got Roboto added there. All right, let's dive into Illustrator and take a look at what we can do here. Now, I'm definitely not an expert when it comes to working with type in Illustrator. It is by far my weakest skill when it comes to this, and it's just a lack of practice. So I'm gonna give you a very basic introduction, and then I'll provide you guys some links that I watch just to give you some further information. And I believe that that might be a little bit more useful for you guys. And also, you don't have to sit and listen to my voice for longer than you need to. All right, so we are now inside Illustrator. I've just made a new document here and I'm gonna grab my type tool. Uh, the shortcut for that is T and it is literally a capital T in our toolbar here. Now the type tool works uh, a couple of different ways depending on how we create our type. If I simply with my type tool click uh, let me just increase the size of my font here so that you can actually see. This just creates a text, uh, like a text line. I'm just typing that in there. I can hit enter and I could type in more text down here if I wanted to. But the sort of major caveat to the, f um, the process of simply clicking to create your type is that as soon as I want to affect that type, so I've got my selection tool now, if I wanted to increase or decrease the size of this text box, that actually squashes the text inside of it. All right, so it's simply clicking and typing something out is great when you only have a single line, but it's not very useful when you actually wanna plan out your type. I'm going to click my type tool again, and this time, rather than just clicking, I am gonna click and drag to create a text box. It gets filled in with that nonsense sort of faux Latin um, wording there, and I can actually adjust the text box now without affecting the, uh, or squashing and stretching rather, the type inside. Now I'm just gonna close this up over here. You can obviously see that there's more text that I'm moving out of the way. And I'm doing this just to show you what this red symbol over here means. If you ever see that red symbol appearing in the bottom right corner of your text box, it means that the text box contains text that is currently not visible. You'll see as soon as I drag that down to reveal all the text inside, that red box disappears. So that's your sort of visual cue to tell you that there is more copy in there that is not being seen. Now what's great about this little box, and uh, if you sort of do find yourself working with type in Illustrator quite often, you might find this to be a useful trick. If you click on that red box, you'll now see that my mouse indicator has changed slightly. It's highlighted the box of text that I originally had, and now it kind of looks like a little segment of a newspaper clipping. If I click and drag, it creates a new text box, but you can see that this linking line that we have over here shows that this is a continuation of the text that we originally had in our first box. I'll just click on that red box again and draw out another one there, and you can see a path being made to kind of show you that these are all part of the same text they're just being shown in different boxes. All right, let me delete these and get them out the way. And uh, once more, I'm just gonna click and drag out my text box here. So once you've dragged and drawn out a text box, we have some more options available to us. And we can find those options by simply double clicking on the text tool in the toolbar. So I've double clicked there and it opens up our area type options. Now, I don't have a lot of experience with this. I tend to work in Adobe InDesign when it comes to working with text, but the area type provides us a lot of opportunity to set up our text boxes. 
So you'll see that I could add a number of rows over here. I could add a number of columns instead. So I can do a lot of planning with this. I could set the span for either of those. Um, and this is all getting a lot more technical than I've ever needed to work with. So I won't sort of lie to you and say that I know how to do this well, but this is how you get to this text setting option so that you know what to Google when you ever find yourself in need of it. I'm just gonna cancel that and I am going to delete this. Now, the last thing that I think you might find useful, and uh, to do this, I'm just gonna draw out a circle quickly, is how to align your text to a shape. So I've just drawn out my circle. I'm just gonna swap it over so it applies it. Uh, the fill is nothing and the stroke is black. And I'm just gonna center that in my screen. Now, if I click and hold over my text tool, there is a type on a path option. I'm gonna release on that and you'll see that I now get this option here. My indicator looks like the sort of typing tool, but it has a dotted line through it. And if I click on my circle, it automatically applies the type to that uh, path for me. So it's applied the type to the path of the circle that I've drawn. If I wanted to give another example, I could quickly just draw a rectangle. So let's just make a square there and I'll grab my type on a path tool and just click there and that gets set to that path. All right. So there are definitely a lot of options that allow us to interact with this. We need to come up to the type option here and we have type on a path and we can open up type on a path options. And these provide us with the various effects uh, as well as then sort of, let me just turn on preview there, that would help. So these provide various effects that I can play around with and uh, they can also then see if I want to flip it, whether inside or outside of the path. Um, I can change the baseline so that it is sort of aligned differently here. And uh, that provides us with a lot of options as well to work with our text. Okay, so this has been a super basic introduction. I'm not gonna lie to you and spend more time here. I highly recommend watching some videos on your own to really unlock the potential of the uh, type tool in Illustrator. And I look forward to seeing what you guys do with your poster. Cool. I have one more video to make for you guys. So please make sure to watch that. And then I'll catch you guys in the next one. Ciao.